Welcome everybody to Basel Book Company's virtual event series. I need glasses. Um, it is day 4,831 of us being in business. Uh, we are so honored to have uh, Louis Bayard back for the second time at Boswell, for the third time in Milwaukee, for his uh, book, Jackie and Me. Uh, the book has also been winning uh, raves around uh, everywhere, including Boswell. Um, in the Washington Post, Anna Petoniak praised the book, noting the sheer enjoyability of this novel. Jackie and Me is a story perfectly tuned to our ongoing fascination with the Kennedy marriage and a novel like Jackie herself with charm to spare. It was also named one of the books of summer by People magazine. Louis Bayard is a New York Times notable um, book author and has been shortlisted for both the Edgar and Dagger Awards for his thrillers, The Pale Blue Eye and Mr. Timothy. His previous book is Courting Mr. Lincoln, and he teaches at George Washington University. Um, Christina Clancy is uh, author of Shoulder Season and The Second Home and an author who belongs on the local shelf. And <laughs> what, what's with this? So we're working that out. Um, she has a PhD in creative writing from UW-Milwaukee and has taught at Polite College before focusing full-time on her writing. Um, please give them both a big hand. Thank you so much. Hey. There you go. Yeah? Does that work? <laughs> what do you know? You just move a switch and things, things happen. <laughs> Louis, I'm so thrilled you're here. I'm thrilled to be here. It's, I feel like, so... People say that blurbs on books don't matter. And it's always mystifying to me now when you reach for a book and the back of it doesn't say what the book is about. It just has blurbs. And um, I've asked about that practice and apparently it really works, but they matter for me with your book because <laughs> the back of, of your book has blurbs by Julia Johnson, who I think is tuning in tonight. She's the author mm -hmm. of Be Frank With Me Hi, and Julia. Better Luck Next Time. Yeah. And, um, and she's, she texted me right after I posted that I was going to be in conversation <laughs> with Louie. And she was like, I am so jealous you get to be with Louie. And then the <laughs> other person who's jealous I get to be with you is Stephen Rowley, who wrote The Gunkle, um, which a lot of you guys have read. And he's a friend of mine. And the editor um, about Jackie. And, Jackie. Yes. Onassis as, an, as a book editor. Yeah. yeah, which a lot of people didn't realize she was a book editor, but his yeah. second book was called The Editor. And it's fantastic. And I was in conversation with Stephen about that. So um so I just feel like the cool kids right. have endorsed you. So welcome right. so to Milwaukee. Welcome to the lunch table where where, where we, we, get yeah. to, we, we get to hang out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'll get demoted soon, but tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's lovely to see you. And I um, I really enjoyed your book. Thank I, you. Uh, Daniel, I know, who was talking about how he knew I would like your book. And <laughs> that's the great thing about a bookseller is they know what your book tastes are and they can just put a book in your hand and say, you're going to like it. And my favorite thing when Daniel recommends a book is he doesn't tell me why I'll like it. And he says, don't read anything about it. You're just going to like this book. And so I, I picked up the galley mm -hmm. and I loved it. And um, I wonder if you could just start out. I, Daniel gave a brief description of it, but it's really um, it's sometimes hard for writers to describe their own book. And I wonder if mm -hmm. you could just tell me, like, what to you is this book about? To me, this is a book about Jackie before she became that Jackie. So that Jackie could be anything. It could be the, the wife of the president with the pillbox hat. I love that uh, drawing, by the way, out, out on the chalkboard outside. Uh, there is a pillbox, pillbox hat in there too. It could be the, the beautiful widow of the, the beautiful children. It could be the wife of the Greek tycoon, the book editor, um, the paparazzi magnet, familiar to many ge generations of tabloid readers. And I know we were all one of them. We were all those readers. I was. Um, and of course, the style icon, so many avenues into this enduringly mysterious woman, but I chose this, this, this avenue of the Jackie before that. And she's just, she's a recent college graduate. She's a working journalist in Washington, DC. She's working as the inquiring camera girl for Washington Times Herald, which was the Hearst newspaper in that day, long since expired. And she's buttonholing pe people in the streets. These are man in the street interviews as they used to call them and asking them some random question that she's determined and taking their picture and taking down their answers and turning it all into a column, developing the photographs herself and doing this six days a week. So she's a working journalist and a career girl, as they used to say, um, her inscription in the, her 
um, Miss Porter's School for Girls yearbook was that her goal in life was quote not to be a housewife. So this is this is what she's in, embarking on. Um, but the 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 I the the me in this the other guy on, on the other side of the ampersand is a guy named Lem Billings, who I, I hadn't heard of until um, three four years ago. Um, and I got received an issue of my college alumni weekly, which is confusingly a bi-weekly. And on this, on this uh, magazine cover was this picture of two young men, collegiates um, from the 1930s. And they were kind of leaning against a wall and doing this kind of mock Mae West sort of pose, pushing their hips out toward the camera. And um, I was looking at the smaller one of them because he was rather pretty and rather slightly built and rather familiar. And gradually the, the face of John Fitzgerald Kennedy re reassembled itself. The liminal version of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, not the, not the engraved guy on the, on the half dollar coin or the Kennedy Center, but this, this guy on the cusp of maturity. But then of course I, my eye went to the other guy who was his uh, turned out to be Kirk Lemoyne Billings, whose main claim to renown in his own eyes and the world's eyes was being Jack Kennedy's best friend. Um, but one of the things I discovered about him was that he also had a, a catbird seat on the courtship between Jack and Jackie when they first met in Washington, DC in the early fifties. And he was a, an eyewitness and also a big player in that, um, in that courtship. So suddenly I had the triangle that is so beloved to me. I love triangles. Uh, they're, in, they're intrinsically interesting because somebody in a triangle is not being as well served as the others. Um, so that's kind of how it began. Did you know the minute you saw that photo, I'm going to write a book about this? I think I did. I think I did. I mean, it really did begin with Lem, because Lem to me was the interesting guy. He was this guy who uh, had a career of his own, but um, subordinated his whole life to, the, to Jack and to the Kennedy family. I should add, too, that he was a closeted gay man. Uh, that was also one of the things that intrigued me about it. Um, or as they used to say, uh, in those days at practicing homosexual. Uh, <laughs> I always love that phrase because I thought if they keep practicing, <laughs> will they get better? Will, will, will they just get better at it? Um, but, and as a practicing homosexual, he would have um, found moments of connect, connected with men however he could, um, you know, on random on streets and parks and bathrooms, um, hoping the whole while that the other guy wasn't a, an under, undercover cop or a, a thug or someone who was going to rat him out a minute later or 30 years later. Uh, but the more I, I looked into his life and his history, the more I realized his heart was reserved for, for one man, and that was Jack. When Jack needed somebody to go to Europe after college, Jack Lem was there. When Jack needed somebody to help with his first congressional campaign, his first presidential campaign. Um, Lem was there for that. And when Jack needed somebody to help coax and cultivate and nurture and befriend this young woman in his life, uh, Jacqueline Bouvier, he was there for that too. And then really the premise of that is these two unlikely people come together and they're bound by a couple of things when they're, um, but the main thing is that they're both in love with the same man um, and they love him perhaps more than they should. I love that. Yeah. It's, and you know, one thing that I think is particularly masterful about your book that struck me as, as, as soon as I finished it was when you write a story and it's through the perspective of somebody who is seeing someone for you, where they're bearing witness to someone, especially Jacqueline Onassis, right. you know, like that's, that's a really big personality. It oftentimes the narrator has to take a back seat. Like they have to be very, um, mild because of what they're observing. They, they, you want the focus to be on this more um, sparkly personality. Whereas it's, it's the I, Nick Carraway problem, isn't it? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you, you strike such a nice balance between making Lem part of the story too, where he mm -hmm. gets as much play as a character. I felt very attached to him. Good. I'm by glad the I end. did too. I did did too. you struggle with that though? Like finding that balance? Absolutely. Absolutely. I did. Because in my mind, this was always going to be this was Lem's story from the start. Um, uh, my editor is, <laughs> and I love her, uh, but she is, a, she is a former People Magazine editor who, with, with basically an honorary PhD in Kennedyology. So, so her, 
so her vision was Jackie the whole way. And guess who guess who made the cover? That was that was Jackie. So I get that. I mean, that's that's what people come in for. But to me, it was always Lem's story. But so it it was a tough balance, and I had to kind of and it took a while. This was this was kind of a bitch of a book to rewrite. It went through some changes, um, and it had to. And it was me just. It was this dance. You know how it works with editors. This dance of figuring. Okay, what is the story we're trying to tell? For me, the thing that helped crystallize it, oddly enough, was the most recent season of The Crown. Did, did people, <laughs> folks see that? Um, it was the Princess Diana uh, uh, story, basically. And that whole arc, I suddenly saw the parallel between that and Jackie. They were both these, um, these rather timid, you know, blue-blooded gals who were tossed without a lot of preparation into a fairly brutal dynasty uh, and left to fend for themselves. So once, once I got that, arc than than I was home. So I'm grateful to the crown. Uh, you never you never know when, where the inspiration will will happen. So was the story more lem and then yes. and then you had to pull back the lem to I had to pull back the lem and 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 bring some more Jack more Jackie and more Jack too. More Jack too. Um, I mean, in my mind they were all kind of they were major characters. It wasn't like um, but it was just about finding the balance and um, and I think we got there, but it took it took some work. Yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting that there is some give and take. Yeah. Uh, on on that. Yes, end. there was definitely a give and take, and there was some some angry edits. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will say too that my my uh, inspiration structurally was uh, the remains of the day, which is about if, if uh, I consider that one of the most perfectly structured books I've ever read, and it's about this butler. You, you most I'm sure you, all you guys have seen seen the movie or read the book or both, but this butler who realizes he's devoted his life to uh, a person who doesn't really deserve it. And that to me is, that to me was also kind of built into the arc too. But um, anyway, it was just just um, that structural issue and trying to keep the, there's a, it's, a, it's told in flashback. So Lem is telling the story from 1981. So the idea is not to be too meandering or zig, ziggy zagging too much. It's just a lot of technical stuff that would be boring to <laughs> most people to kind of like, but it was just trying to get the right thing. And it took, it took a couple goes. Well, yeah. I think I think you really achieved it. Well, thank you. And thank um, you. I actually was also curious about how you found the balance between Jacqueline and JFK Jr. Because you, you know, they're both so enigmatic, and you want to know both of them. But it's really Jackie's story. And yeah. so I, I did. You feel by the time you finished the book, like you really knew one of them, or did you feel like you knew your idea of them that you wanted on the page? That's a great question. Um, the one I still don't know, and it was true, courting Mr. Lincoln, my last book, I never, I, to me, Lincoln is the great mystery in that book. And he's, he was a mystery to everyone who knew him. Uh, even the people closer to, closest to him never felt like they really knew him. And to me, Jack is that figure in, in this one. He's that guy, extremely charismatic, extremely attractive, um, a leader of men. And yet I, I don't know how well anybody knew him. Um, Jackie to me is knowable because this is the the younger version of herself. This is the that person, the the scrapping career girl who's just trying to get by and um, doesn't really have any money of her own, is kind of lonely. And um, but is also because she's a young woman of that era drawn toward matrimony in the way you you had to be in that world. You you, you were supposed to find a husband and Jackie's mother, uh, Mrs. Auchincloss is, is quite ferociously bent on Jackie finding the right husband. And and by the way, doesn't think Jack Kennedy is the right husband. She has this, this, this blue blooded aristocratic disdain for the Kennedys and you know those parvenu Irish roots, even though she herself was Irish. Um, so, um, so yeah, so she's she's really kind of torn and um, in a way that I think is is um, easy to empathize with. I also thought since I haven't tossed off enough literary res reference yet, um, I thought of Lily Bart a little bit uh, in the House of Mirth. To me, the the Jackie of this book is an Edith Wharton heroine. She's she's she she doesn't really want to be part of this world, but she doesn't have a lot of options to get out of it. And she's really struggling in both directions. So, and that's the last literary name I will drop over the course of, <laughs> over the course of this evening, I promise. 
Well, I thought it was really interesting too, how Lem and Jackie kind of go together because they both are boxed in mm -hmm. by the expectations people have of them. Right. And um, what was it like writing dialogue? I, I was, I, I, ever since I read the editor, Stephen Rowley's book, where yeah. when Jacqueline Onassis is working as the, you know, for Double Day as an editor. It's a great book. And I would read his dialogue and I thought, how do you come up with how someone speaks? Like, what would they say? That seems like it would be hard, but you really nail it with Jacqueline in, in, in your book where I, you, I feel like I could imagine her saying these things. Did you listen to her speak a lot? Did you watch a lot of videos with her? It's interesting there. There's not a lot of voice recordings of her. Um, um, it's, she is very much a still photograph. She's a, she's a, a photograph specimen. You can find them on YouTube, but the vo and the voice of course is, fascinating right it's that baby doll um baby doll voice that whispery kind of oddly it's, it's very similar to Marilyn monroe's voice right very, very whispery very baby doll um but it's only when you read about her that you realize she had this wicked sense of humor uh, and wicked edge to her that came out in in private conversation um but no i i i, I do a lot of reading you probably do this i i read a lot aloud I read everything I write aloud more than once. My kids used to freak out a little bit. And then when, when they were young, it's like, what, who are you talking to in the next room? Um, um, but, I, but that to me helps get the voice down. And you write every, every character has a different, so Lem's voice, and he's the narrator. It's very chatty, it's garrulous. It's, you know, um, it's a little saucy. Um, and Jackie, but Jackie is kind of her own little edge to her too. So it's just, just working it, but I, dialogue for me is relatively easy. It's the first thing I write, and it's the thing I use to block out um, successive chapters. I'm, I'm curious, do you, how do you work? Do you write dialogue first? What do you I write? Don't do you write I kind first? of write into the dialogue. I write. I write. I'm a real bricklayer when I write, so I just go, you know, from beginning to end, and then when they speak, then I add it in. But I feel it's it's so interesting when you write dialogue because it just breathes air into your manuscript. Mm -hmm. Like all of a sudden it's almost a relief You're like oh they're yeah. speaking and then it's so much fun when you write dialogue and someone will say something that's really funny or really interesting you're like oh <laughs> you know where'd that come from they surprise you right if yeah. you're if you're i think if you're doing it right they'll 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 surprise you they'll they'll do something you didn't expect yeah yeah it was yeah. It, that was really interesting and so one thing that i did when i was reading your book is and i has anyone read the book yet okay so I like I thought I knew a fair amount about the Kennedys, but it turns out I really didn't. And it had, it had also been a while since I'd done a, a deep dive into uh, Kennedy life. And as I was reading, I kept putting the book down to Google to see like, well, what does Esther Kennedy look like? And who are all these kids? And then pretty soon I was learning all about Kit Kennedy because of the yeah, reference. Yeah. Oh my gosh, like that could be a next book. She was, she had a fascinating life. Fascinating life, yeah. And Kit yeah. Kennedy is, do you mind just, just like telling the audience about Kit Kennedy really? Quickly? Sure, she was the oldest daughter of, of Joe and Rose Kennedy uh, and and uni almost universally beloved, just a, a delight. Um, she, when her dad was ambassador of, of to England, U.S. ambassador to England, she, 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 well, was she dead by the year? I know Jackie, Jackie was for sure, but yeah, she may have been, um, but she just completely charmed London society and she would, she was enormously popular and outgoing and friendly. Um, then made two crucial mistakes in her mother's eyes. She married a Protestant um, <laughs> during the war. And then after he died, she then uh, became basically the girlfriend of a, of, of a still married man, died in a plane crash. Um, in France, uh, not not too long after the war, deeply grieved, uh, except by her mother, who said that was the act of God. So um, this is the, this is the word. Rose was a horror. That was one of the yeah. things I oh, discovered. Yeah. <laughs> Rose was a horror. Um, so yeah, kick is great, and uh, yeah, the challenge becomes. I I I went in as a Kennedy agnostic. I didn't have any particularly deep knowledge of them. So um, I was born eight days after Kennedy was assassinated. So I didn't inherit any of the, the the cultishness of that. I didn't have any brief for them or brief against them. I just thought, oh, this is an interesting family. Um, but I, it was, yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot to research. I, I still struggle. It's like, okay, which one is Pat? Which one is Jean? You know, there's so many of them. Um, but uh, but fortunately, you, you know, I, I, I had people, I had just a couple to narrow down my, my gaze to. 
Well, I'm, I'm fascinated by your research because it's so well balanced every now and then I'll read a book and I'll, you can almost feel the writer Googling something, you know, <laughs> and you're like, oh, this sounds like they really thought they, they should get it in there. I and really, yeah, yeah, I hate that. It's yeah, <laughs> it doesn't feel like that at all. It all feels very organic to the story mm -hmm. that you're trying to tell. And you very carefully choose the details that the reader might need to know. Mm -hmm. And you don't necessarily expound on it too much. Like you don't feel like you need to explain too much. It's, it's what the characters would know that they're passing along. But I, because it's so fascinating and because there are so many players in the Kennedy universe, how did you stop researching in order to write? <laughs> and when I, I was thinking that the whole time I read this, and I think a bunch of people who are watching online and when you guys read this book, this will probably be a question you'll be asking, like, how did you even write the story when you were doing so much research? Did, did the research come first as you were going? Did you lose weeks to learning about <laughs> like the Kennedy who Taylor Swift wrote a song about? Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> Which Kennedy was that? Her, Connor Kennedy, right? Connor Kennedy. <laughs> I've done so my research. Many, after. I learned a lot so after many reading damn this generations. book. It's, I know I should write. I should write a like response, a novel in response to your book, just based on my own Google searches. Um, well, two things. One of them is that uh, um, the the beauty of catching them at a relatively young age, catching Jackie, say. Um, or even Jack is just what 31, 32, and this is happening. You don't have to research anything that happens afterwards. So I have no idea what happens to Jackie after she marries Jack Kennedy. Because the book, the book, the book stops right there. I don't have to do anything from that point on. Um, but in terms of the research, I usually do a few months up front just to kind of walk, get to a place where I can walk around. And then I start writing the book because I just I'm itching to. I was recently talking to Karen uh, Joy Fowler. Uh, she wrote a, a very big, ambitious book about the Booth family from the 19th century. She said she does a year of research before she even writes a word. I can't, I can't, I would just go mad if I had to do that. So I need to start writing at some point just to know that there's something there. And then the book instructs me what I still need to know, which is often considerable. And I never feel like I've become an expert about anything about the Kennedys, about Lincoln, about it. I just feel like I learn enough to find my way. But I, if if you put me up against a real expert, I would I would fail every time. Um, how so. about how about Lem? Because I was curious. I was thinking there might be less archival information about Lem. When I talk about Lem, I really feel like I'm talking about a friend. Like, <laughs> I feel like he's, he's my friend too. That's nice. From reading the book. Yeah, I felt that way too. I'm glad you I'm glad you felt that you way. You guys are gonna make a new friend. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Lem, um, well, first of all, there's an excellent nonfiction book uh, called Jack and Lem by David Pitts, uh, which, which, which is a great resource. But Lem also left some interviews behind, which are now uh, housed and digitized within the Kennedy Library. And they're fairly frank interviews that he left behind. Um, uh, and, and he admits, for instance, that he was tasked with explaining to Jackie just what she would be getting into when she married Jack, she, that he was, he, he was tasked with telling her, you know, this guy is not going to be exactly faithful to you. He's been a bachelor all his life. That's not going to be changing anytime soon. Um, so he was very much part, he was a participant in this, this, um, this courtship. One of the things too, speaking of voice, there is one voice recording of Lem on YouTube. It happened in a, um, he was actually captured calling, he was calling Jack at the White House. Lem had his own room at the White House, by the way. He went there every weekend. The Secret Service waved him through. Um, and he was calling Jack and his voice was recorded on the now notorious White House tape recording system, right? Which, which, which was still not a big deal in those days. And the voice is extraordinarily high. I, it, the first time I listened to it, it really is, sounds like a woman's voice. And that was also kind of key for me for thinking about Lemmy. He mentions a couple of times in the book, the fact that he has this high voice that gets higher when he's agitated. Um, and there's some, there's some gay bashing that happens over the course of that, the book. And Lem also runs, um, experiences a, a kind of form of oppression that was pretty common to, to closeted gay men of that era. So, um, but it, there's, there's enough around, there's enough around and, but there's, um, it, it, it was fascinating to, to meet him. Uh, and to figure out what his life would have been like. He's really lovingly evoked. And I think another pleasure of reading this book is because Jacqueline Kennedy seems so 
removed from us. Like mm-hmm. she's, she's a very private person and she almost seems like she exists in a whole different order of human being than we do, you know, <laughs> like, um, but I think it levels the playing field. It makes her accessible. And she's kind of like, we are, she's yeah. insecure. She's, yeah. She doesn't know a lot about what she's getting into. She needs Lem's advice. And it's nice to see her at a, in a more vulnerable point in her life. And also to realize all the pressure that was put on her by her own family. Like, you know, maybe you can talk a little bit about her family. That, sure. Cause that was, I love learning about her family. Yeah. Like Blackjack. Yeah. Blackjack. So yes. Um, her, her parents were, her father was Blackjack Bouvier, who was this notoriously dissolute fellow cheated on his wife, um, on during their honeymoon, actually with Doris Duke on an ocean liner. Um, and, um, yeah, uh, a, a scoundrel and a rake, but also a great charmer. Um, and his the mother with it, it was Janet, um, who they they divorced, and then she, instead of retreating into into solitude the way divorcees were once supposed to, she set her caps even higher for a Standard Oil heir named Hugh Auchincloss, who was functionally impotent, or so it was thought. And Janet somehow managed to have two more kids with him. So she was a pretty she was a pretty strong she was a pretty strong gal, um, and with who's very determined and very willful. And um, she and Jackie had a very intense, often. Um, um, combative relationship um but that but but that was very much that but it's very much the world of newport uh, that was the world that jackie grew up in and yet part of her insecure insecurity her vulnerability is she herself doesn't have any money she doesn't the auchincloss fortune is not coming to her um her dad has squandered his own family fortune so she she can't afford to be oblivious to money. She has to find a way either as a career, either through a career or through a husband or through some combination of both. So th- there is that vulnerability. And that's another parallel with Lem, by the way, whose dad died in the middle of the Great Depression and, and the family fortune was lost there too. So they were both people who grew up amidst great wealth without any having any of their own. And that gives them that special outlier status, which I think is one of the things that draws them together. Yeah. And I think you, you depict the kind of class consciousness and the status issues and even the Irish status yeah. the Kennedy family um, and the waspy, mm-hmm. you know, blue blood Newport yeah. crowd. Um, it's, that's a wonderful conflict. And the other thing I think that's so great about um, hearing about Jacqueline through Lem's perspective is you, you're kind of addressed as a reader directly by Lem. Like you're the, you're the person who's being spoken to. And so you feel like he's gossiping with you. Like you're like, you've met this fabulous, fascinating person who knows the Kennedys and he's just dishing gossip. Like it's just no big deal. You know, like yeah. those little, like the little juicy morsels you're feeding us yeah. is exactly what the whole book is filled with. Yeah. It's funny. I, and you'll appreciate this. I thought, do I need to have a device? Do I need to have, is Lem writing his memoirs? Is he dictating this to somebody? And I forget, maybe it was my editor said, no, you don't need a device. He's he's just talking to us. We don't need to know why he's doing this or how he's doing this. And there's also the fact that he he seems to know stuff that happens where he's not around. I had this this feeling like, well, I have to explain that he learns this because he had a con Jackie told him this at a later date. And it was my agent who said, just give him the authority to 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 go where he where he needs to go. You know, uh, it's a different kind of omniscience um, that he practices there. And it's interesting because I think he's much more insightful about Jackie than he is about himself. The closer he gets to himself, the more clueless he becomes. He never even uses the word gay. That, that word gay never happens in this book because that was just typical, I think, of, of gay men of his generation. They were, they were no, no, um, they would never. And, and the, the, the gay men I knew from that generation were always spoken code, even among other gay men. They just couldn't declare themselves because they were, you know, they were hounded they were harassed. They were arrested. They, you know, they were, they lived in fear for so long that even when they no longer had post Stonewall, no longer had to do that. They were, they couldn't get out of that habit. And Lem is one of those guys. But it was kind of a relief. Well, I don't, I don't want to give away anything about you, <laughs> but you know that this is a retrospective narrator. You know that you're in 1981 right? when he's, which my book is set in 1981 too. Yeah. So I feel like that's another, yeah, another we, were yeah, we were meant to be together. Um, <laughs> but you know that this narrator is looking back on something and, and, and that it's kind of a relief to know that Lem gets a little bit more freedom, you mm-hmm. know, even if he doesn't allow himself too much. He's, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, and um, he actually, I, he died in 1981, and I, and but I feel confident that if he had lived, he would have would would have been one of the the victims of AIDS very early on because he was sexually active. Um, he was a practicing homosexual, uh, but but <laughs> um, but in a way that you know. He, in a way, he was always very clear not to embarrass the Kennedy family. The Kennedys knew he was gay. Jack and Jackie both knew that. And they were very live and let live about that subject. Um, and I think it's fascinating, by the way, that Jack Kennedy's best friend in the world was a gay man. Um, I don't think a lot of people know that. And it kind of redeems him a little bit. Because we I, I, I mean, I'm the kind of person who thinks that when I think of JFK Jr., I think of those dinner plates that people would hang out by their kitchen table, you know, like your your friend's grandmother who would have that. Next to the Pope. And yeah, next to the Pope. Yeah, and the, um, the Catholic, the Catholic. Uh, and yeah. boy, we get a little different version of him in this book. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to be, given what we know know about him um, and his predilections and, and his, his very busy um, sex life. Um, um, <laughs> But at the same time, he was, a, he was a person of great charm and great intellect um, and courage. One of the things I think the book also makes clear is that he was how um, his health situation, I mean, he was a guy who was pretty much dying you know, from, from an early age. He spent so much time in hospitals. He actually said this to Lem that Lem should write his memoir and call it subtitle it a medical history because he spent so much time in and out of hospitals, Addison's disease, uh, was still imperfectly understood and, and imperfectly treated. He had to give himself injections in his thigh, you know, every day, painful, painful injections. Um, so he, you know, there was, there was a lot of courage that it, it, you know, it took a lot of courage to do what he did um, to, to get up and every day and, 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 and try to live and try to be a public servant. Um, so I, you know, I, I have some respect for him, residual respect for him too. Oh yeah, no, that, that comes through as well. But yeah. I, I, I probably am thinking more from Jacqueline's perspective. Yeah, like no. I'm choosing somebody to marry, you know, and, and I think that you you often bring up Schrodinger's, or Sch 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 Schrodinger's Schrodinger's cat, yeah. Schrodinger's cat, like that, this idea that she could have chosen differently. It's This is actually really satisfying for people who love those sliding doors type narratives. Yeah. You know, like what if, what if she just stayed in London? What if she'd done all these different things? And yeah. I kind of wondered if Lem would overall think that she'd made a mistake or that he needed somebody else to be part of the Kennedy world. An ally. Yeah. yeah. That, that's an interesting idea. Yeah. Now the, the whole book talks a lot about, um, it's really a book about contingency, it, the, the, the roads not taken, that we might still in some alternate universe still be taking. Um, and um, Jackie, for instance, was in love with this this young writer in Paris. His name was John Marquand. He was... I looked him up, <laughs> and I looked all about his dad. His dad, <laughs> his dad was a very famous novelist, J.P. Marquand, who was sort of this premier, the premier chronicler of WASP America, a satirist, very successful. Um, what were his books? Um, the late George Apley, H.M. Pullum, Esquire. Anyway, his son wrote his own book under the name of John Phillips. And it's a very fine book. It's out of, long out of print, but I found it. And it's really a terrific read. And, uh, and Jacqueline was, Jackie was in love with him and kind of had the idea of being his muse. And um, so a lot of different avenues. And one of the things I, I realized too in writing the book, I think we all have those moments in our lives, some point where uh, uh, so many, uh, uh, maybe a, an infinite number of futures radiate out from this point, depending on which choice you make in that moment. And, um, and, and I think we all have one, one or two of those moments in our lives. And looking back, we can see, oh, that could have been entirely different if I had you know, been looking that way instead of that way, or if I'd done that. So I find contingency a really fascinating sentence. Yeah, when I was reading, I was like, wait, no, Jackie, stay, do this. You know? <laughs> I, want, I want to know what that's going to be like, this yeah. alternative history. Yeah. Um, so I, I know we have some questions from the audience, but I just have one other question for you. Yeah. And that is, all right, I have like a million other questions. So we could just well, we, go. We, we'll, we'll do dinner. Yeah. We, we're we're, yeah, eating, we're but, eating dinner after. But one question I had for you is, You've written a number of other books, you've mm -hmm. written um, thrillers, and then you've written more historical fiction. I think with every, first of all, I'm curious why you switched and if you're going to switch back mm -hmm. in genre wise. And then I'm also wondering, every book is so different to write. And if there is something that you learned writing this book about writing that you 
didn't know before, like that, that taught you a lesson that maybe you can carry forward into another book, or maybe it's just very special in particular to this one. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a deep Christmas. Yeah. That's deep. <laughs> um, so I, I see contingency operating in my own career too, because I became a mystery thriller writer by accident. I, I wandered into it. It really started with Mr. Timothy, which um, was a book inspired by Dickens and Tiny Tim and Christmas Carol. And I wanted to just do bad things to him. And I realized that to do that, I had to create a, a thriller kind of thing it needed to happen. Um, so I became a historical writer by novelist by accident and a thriller mystery thriller writer by accident. And then um, a few years ago, I just pivoted toward this new genre of the courtship novel, the marriage novel. Um, and again, that was a little accidental. It was just a function of where I was in my career, a new agent and a, no publisher and just deciding, oh, let's try this. Um, and I guess what's the, the difference now is that the thrill for me is now finding some previously unexplored area of history, some part of history that defies explanation and probing it not for a solution, which is what the traditional mystery offers, but for the full extent of its mystery, which is often in the case of this book and the last book, the mystery of the human heart, the question of, dear God, why do we love the people we do? <laughs> How did that happen? Why don't they love us back? Um, so so it's, it's a different kind of mystery and a different kind of thrill, but um, yeah, I, I just go where I go. I've never been able to um, write in a series um, for that reason. I just, I'm always looking for something a little different from what happened before. Um, and who knows where the next one will go. I have um, an ancestor who's, um, who was an accused witch in Hartford in 1662, Hart yeah, 1662, 20 years before the Salem witch trials, there, was, there were witch uh, trials in Hartford and she was in prison and somehow got out and I, yeah, maybe I'll do a witch book or something like that. But Those are kind of big right now. Yeah, I'm right? Some titles. Everyone likes a good witch, yeah. yeah? There's a, a a book called Hester coming out in the fall that my editor. Oh, Hester edited. Prynne. Yeah, it's 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 a, an alternative history of, of Nathaniel Hawthorne. Sweet. So I that might be. You know, oh yes. Put something to put on your list. There we go. Yeah. There we go. Um, and so, uh, oh, and, and what did you learn from this book? Anything? Um, I I think I'm done with presidents now. This is my third president. I did a, I did a book called Roosevelt's Beast too. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm good with presidents, but um, I learned that, you know, everything is potentially interesting. I would never have thought in a million years I would write a book about Jackie Kennedy, or Jackie Bouvier as she was. Um, I never thought in a million years I would do that and just sort of happened that way. So I've learned to be open to where chance happenstance leads me, right? In whatever direction, because there's always a story somewhere. That's right? why I was, I was just talking about my book, The Shoulder Season, it's yeah. about Playboy bunnies. You know, <laughs> the old Playboy resort in Lake Geneva. I had no interest in Playboy growing up. I had yeah. never thought I would be a chronicler of, of Playboy bunnies, but the more women you interview and you find out about the super weird world, the more you're like, oh, yeah. this is really fun. Somebody oh, yeah. needs to write about this. Oh yeah. There's a story. Everyone has a story. Everything I think has a story. Yeah. We just have to find it. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, I'd love to hear some questions from the audience and also from the online audience. I know there are a number of you out there. So <laughs> yeah. So the question is about Kennedy and Lincoln being kind of unknown. And, and why is that? Is it because their life was cut short or? Um, I think it was just a function of their, their personality. I think that's, that's one of the reasons that um, Lincoln is, eternally interesting, not just because he was so historically consequential, but because there's this, there's this mystery about him. I think Jackie has the same mystery about her. I think that's why we're still fascinated by her because there's something we don't quite know when we look at that, that graven image of her. Um, so I think it was definitely about their personality for sure. Um, you know, Jack was certainly more extroverted than Lincoln, more voluble, very charm, much more charming and, and had all those kind of social qualities. But I think there was something quite hidden about him as well. He spent a lot of his time alone um, in hospital beds. A lot of time, he was a reader, enormous reader because he had so much time to kill. <laughs> um, so there was this whole kind of hidden sort of life, some, some inner life that I don't think necessarily communicated itself to people. I know Jackie never felt that she understood him. It was a very troubled marriage for the most part, at least initially. Um, so they're fascinating characters, but, but hard to live with, I would think. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Question? Yes. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, that would be wonderful. Yeah, Barry, you're coming. Of course. Of course, I didn't bring my own book. And you know, me. one thing, I was actually thinking about this, about hearing you read it when I was reading the book. And something I really admire about the novel is the way that you end chapters. Oh. The, the ends of chapters are just beautiful. And they really kind of like you have all these things happening in the chapter. And then it's almost like, like the plane just takes off the runway by the time you get to the end of the chapter. And then you can't wait to get to the next chapter. Well, thank you. That's yeah. lovely. That's what a lovely compliment. Thank you. Um, I think endings are important. I know you do too. Um, and beginnings, but, and they're hard. They're hard. It's hard to get right, the right ending. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to read this short passage. This is, this is Lim's first meeting with Jackie as it comes in the first chapter. And, uh, what's happened is, um, he and Jack are going to, um, Bobby and Ethel's, um, but at the last minute, Jack swerves across, Actually, I'll just start there and then we'll, we'll, we'll I, I won't be too long. All right, it's the weekend before St. Patrick's Day, 1952. And there's still a late winter nip in the air, but Jack always keeps the top down because by age 34, he knows how dashing his hair looks in high wind. By the way, can we help kill the men's hat industry, right? Because he didn't wear hats. He liked how his hair looked without hats. Um, we're due at Bobby and Ethel's that night, but Jack instead cuts across Chain Bridge. I shoot him a look and he says, imagine the offhandedness, that we have an additional passenger. Oh yes, I say, and who should that be? Uh, Miss Bouvier. Mind you, there's nothing in that honorific miss to signify a lady of distinction. He, he refers to virtually all his girls that way. She might be a cashier at the Montel Pharmacy or Finland's deputy chief of mission. And you won't know until you've pulled up in front of her apartment building and seen her tottering through the front gate, a blonde in a crew neck cardigan or a brunette in a bullet bra. And it's always the latter who raises her hand for you to kiss and the former who comes at you straight on like an encyclopedia salesman. And whoever it is remains miss in our conversation until such time as the business is consummated, at which point she devolves into her component parts. There is nothing in short about a Miss Bouvier to separate her from her predecessors. Were I to search his face, his soul, down to the most granular level, I would find no clue, for there is perhaps none to find. Miss Bouvier is a destination. And now that we've crossed into Virginia, the only thing left to figure out is where she might live. Clarendon, Cherrydale, a group home in Fort Myer, maybe. But we speed past all those destinations before steering up Old Dominion Drive. Nature rushes forth and the car dealers and the hot shops fall away before dogwoods and tulip trees, tatters of forsythia. So they're going to Marywood, which is the baronial estate uh, that Jackie shares with her stepfather and mother, um, just off the Potomac River. Um, all I can make out through my encrusted specks are a row of white pilasters in a front portico where sits a girl. Doesn't she hear the car's tires on the gravel or see our headlights slicing through the trees? When we first happen upon her, her face is angled away as though she's cocking her ear for a nightingale. Her knees are drawn protectively to her chest and there's something quite exposed about her. I mean, she doesn't look like she belongs there any more than I do. And I briefly wonder if she's a housemaid or a nanny taking her one allotted evening out. Abruptly, she stands and gives us two quick waves. And then as she jogs to the passenger side, comes briefly ablaze in the headlights. By now, of course, I'm extricating myself from the front of the car and inserting myself with no great grace into the back. And the operation is so consuming that for a second or two, I lose all consciousness of her. And then I hear her say in that voice, like a ghost whispering through the pipes, you must be Lem. I mutter something on the order of yes, I must be. And she smiles, a wider smile than I would have guessed possible. The eyes even wider, goat's eyes, that's my first churlish thought, or mad woman's. But maybe that's to forestall the sense that I'm being seen through a wider lens. All in all, there's a certain relief in being able to retreat into the Ford Crest Line's back seat, a planetarium-like darkness with the two of them swimming like moons. She has dabbed herself with Chateau Krigler 12. I consider telling her it's my mother's favorite. And there's the complicating counter aroma of Paul Malls. And somewhere at the back, simple bovine perspiration. For the first time, I begin to wonder if Miss Bouvier is nervous. 
Though it's difficult to confirm because she has a small voice and the wind seems to slap every word back down her gullet. Her general lilt, as best I can tell, is interrogative, but why should that be a surprise? Girls in these days are instructed to shoot out a clean, firm thread of inquiry at all times. The more interested they appear to be, the more the boys will understand they don't have to be in themselves interesting, which is a relief to both parties. Jackie, I imagine, is now asking the name of Bobby's daughter or wondering if Eunice will be there and which one is Pat. <laughs> this is the same wish I'm always asking. Um, for all I know, she's speculating about the Washington Senator's pennant chances. If pressed, she'll fall back on the weather, how chilly it is for March. The point is there's no way of knowing what they're saying and Jack sometimes gets cross if I talk too much with his dates, unless I'm doing something useful like showing them the door. Nothing for it then, but to watch Miss Bouvier's head under the weight of her impending introduction to the Kennedy clan, lol, ever so gradually to the right. It's when we're crossing back over chain bridge that she rouses herself to ask, Jack, what color is your car? Queer question, but then I realize she's never seen Jack's car or Jack himself maybe in the naked light of day. Uh, I don't know, he mumbles, red. Pomegranate, I say. Something quickens in the calm of her neck. By easy degrees, she turns around and bestows on me a fuller version of that first smile. Then she leans toward Jack and in whispers stagey enough for me to hear says, I like your friend. So that's their first name. Thank you. I, I wondered if you were going to use the high voice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's, 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 it's whispery, but it's also low and kind of like my Rose voice too. It's sort of like, again, not a lot of, you don't get a lot of recordings of her. Um, she, I think she, she saw that silence was her, was her ally in some ways, made her more mysterious. That's a really good question. Is there gonna be an audiobook? is the question. Um, <laughs> yes, there is. Um, and I'm blanking on the name of the narrator. I should tell you, that I auditioned to do my, have you, I auditioned to do the audiobook because I've always wanted to do it. Um, I did not get it. Um, yeah, it's a little insulting if, if you fuck up your own book, that's a little embarrassing. Um, but what it actually, the experience made me realize that you need professional actors to do these things because um, you have to differentiate the voices. A nonfiction book is different, a memoir would be different, but um, to do all these characters, it takes a while. So it's out and I can't remember the nice young man who's doing it. He's very sweet. Um, I, I, one, the one thing I told him is like, you know, your voice is a little, it's a very pleasing baritone. I was like, well, Lem was, I'll, I'll send you the clip. <laughs> it was up there, so. Yeah, yeah, Truman Capote kind of thing. And I don't know how sustainable that is for an audiobook narrator to do. I don't know if it'd be pleasing to listen to something like that. Um, but um, so it's out there. Yeah. And, and speaking of audiobooks, if you don't know about Libro.fm, it's a great way to buy audiobooks and still support independent bookstores like Boswell. So if you sign up for Libro.fm, it's just like Audible. It's the same, it's, everything's the same, but you can designate a bookstore like Boswell books. And then whenever people make a purchase, it can support the, the bookstore. So I tell everyone to use Libro FM. That's what I use. Thank you. That's it. That's it. L I B R O dot F M. Oh, is that his name? Yeah. He's dear. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he's dear. <laughs> yeah. Um, at any rate. Yeah. I love it when you listen to an audiobook and you feel like the narrator becomes part of the story too. Like yeah. It's very artistic. It's like, oh, this like new thing is happening. Someone else has entered this world. The thing I, I wanted to read my own book because I, I've loved the audio narrators. I've had very I'm gifted actors doing those things. Um, but I, I know you'll know what I mean. There's a particular music you have in your head and it comes from reading it aloud to myself. And I hear a certain cadence, I hear certain emphases and, 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 and there's no way they could do that because they didn't write it. So there's part of me that wants to kind of get a recording of that, but that's just vanity. I've been reading articles <laughs> about how they want to replace audiobook narrators with AI. Oh no, 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 no. Yeah, no, they're, the no. audiobook narrators feel legitimately threatened right now. So it's kind should, of a oh scary God. movement. So yeah, we, we so need, you have even more competition. I know, I know, it can't be the computers, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah. Do we have any? 
Yeah. Alexa, read me a story. Well, they do that now for on on, on websites for for newspapers and magazine articles. So they'll have some voice reading it to you, very and very Alexa-ish. Uh, not even as warm as Alexa. Yeah. yeah. So it's very strange. Chris, do you have any questions from the audience? Okay, great. Any other questions? I have one. Oh. I am really curious what you're reading now. What you recommend people um, read that you loved. <laughs> Um, I'm so bad at keeping up with current literature, um, but there's a book I just finished by Mbolo Mbwe. Um, do you know it? Mbolo Mbwe, it's her most recent book. Uh, we were all beautiful. We were all, it's set in Africa um, and it's about basically the making of a, of a, how beautiful we were. Thank you. I'm, I suck with titles. Um, I am beautiful. <laughs> How beautiful we were, yeah, in Bolo Mbwe. One of my side lines is I'm the, the chair of the Penn Faulkner Awards. And one of, the, one of the reasons I like that is because I get a long list every year that they, they deposit and I just sort of work my way down that list. But I'm also a really slow, freaking slow reader. I read really slowly. So uh, I am always behind. I'm never up on the, the most recent. Well, and you don't have to write blurbs now, right? When you're uh, <laughs> when you work on these awards committees, doesn't it mean you can't blurb books? No, it doesn't. Um, oh, tell oh, people. Oh wait, oh wait. Yeah. That's what I should tell people. <laughs> I couldn't possibly blurb your book. Oh, that's fascinating. I need to I need to incorporate that into my next. Um, but sometimes I'll read a book that I actually do. Yeah, you, the blurbing thing is. We can talk about that briefly. So it's a it's an interesting process because I know we, we've been on both sides of that. Yeah, um, I mean, it's, I, I always find it kind of, a, like, if somebody asks me to blurb a book, I, I always want to, Yes. you know, and, I, and I never turn impulse. down a book because I don't like it. Like, it, usually legitimately is I'm just kind of busy right now, you know, and, and it's hard for me to, I'm a slow reader also. Yeah. So, um, and as writers, we always have so much to read yeah. that it's, it's, everything's competing for our reading attention. Yeah. So, um, but it, it's such a gift when somebody blurbs your book. It's yeah. so like when it, when it comes through and you get the email from your, from whoever blurbs your book, you're like, Oh, thank you. Thank oh, like you. like Julia and Stephen, our friends Julia, Julia and Stephen. I mean, Stephen. when those came through, I was like, "This is this is awesome." They were it was lovely, and it, it's so affirming. You're right. So you want to be that person for for other words, and and it's hard if if an author is a friend of yours, and you know, you got you sort of feel like you have to, and then yeah, there are situations where uh, a friend wrote a not great book, and so what do you what do you do in that moment? You, you, that's why verbs are. It's a fairly corrupt business. As, um, um, <laughs> so, well, so what I usually do is I fall back on plot recapitulation. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, or I, I, I do a marketing. This is like, you know, Catcher in the Rye meets Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter or something, <laughs> something like that. Um, yeah, I just, I just spin it as marketing, but yeah, anyway. it's the, it's the most dreaded part of everyone's job. And Asking it is things. awful. And uh, yes. And, and, and sometimes being asked, but, but it's, it's also a privilege to be asked because it means people think your name would matter on the back of something. So, yeah. Have we, have we shared too much, too much tea, spilled too much tea about publishing? <laughs> no, I, I think there's a lot more tea to be spilled. <laughs> yeah, Trisha. Yeah, the question is, how do you get your brain? If you're a fiction writer, how do you how do you review other people's work? How do you get your brain into that space? The the best analogy, I, and I don't think it's a use. It's it's not a perfect analogy. If does if anybody sings, you have a there. You really have two voices. Everyone has two voices. You have a chest voice and a head voice, right? The chest voice is um, the, where your normal talking is, and the head voice is a kind of different part. It's still you, but it's a different part of your vocal apparatus that you're using. So to me, the the review is sort of the head voice. It's sort of that more cerebral space and the, and the fictional voice is more heart and gut and stuff like that. So I feel like I'm just singing in a different register when I, when I review. Uh, That's an amazing answer. That's cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always find too, when you review something, whenever I would write reviews, as soon as you get to the end of your review, you realize the end is actually what you really wanted to say. And then you have to start over and, yeah. then, uh, and this beginning. And I also find, even if I'm reviewing something, I wasn't thrilled about at first. Yeah. You develop such an appreciation for the hard work somebody put into a book. Because you know, you know yeah. how much work goes into a book. So it's really hard to piss on something, you know, in 700 words that, right. they, that someone has went, spent two years, three years working on. Yeah. You never want to be the writer who takes down another writer. Right. Especially know. a first time writer. You don't want yeah. to be that person. Yeah. I also find too that a lot of people will read a book, including myself. I've been thinking about this with my own reading tendencies. 
If you find one little niggling thing that you don't like about a book, you can let it color your entire perception of the book. And I've, I had a little talk with myself. I was like, no, I'm going to be a more generous reader. I can look more holistically at mm -hmm. a book and there can be some part of it that maybe I'm not a big fan of, but that doesn't mean the book failed. Right. Like maybe for me, it's something that I was thinking about, you know, but mm -hmm. it's, it's such an undertaking to write a book. I just have so much appreciation for that. Oh, I know. And this book is so good and so well researched <laughs> and so well done. It's like, right? it's amazing. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you. But yeah, it's 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 a weird ethical issue when you're reviewing. This is the only art form where I think you have to kind of turn on each other in this way that we do. It's like you have to vet each other, review each other. You're, you're reviewing your peers. I don't know that that happens in any other art form, just this one. Um, so it's it, it creates weird, weird issues. Um, and Good thing we're also normal. We're also normal. <laughs> Those writers. <laughs> And so free of, yeah, envy or anything like that. Yeah. Great. Daniel, how are we doing for time? Are we? Oh, great. Any other questions before we finish up? Yeah. What are you working on? Um, what am I working on next? I am one of those authors. Are you this way? I'm very superstitious about talking about the next thing. It won't, the witch is currently in the drawer because I couldn't get her off the page of the broomstick or whatever um so it's i will say it's a it's across the pond and it's in england and it's set in norfolk <laughs> you've been to norfolk yes. oh oh okay I'm gonna, I'm gonna come find you i'm gonna come find you all right um yeah i think i need to get over there myself and it's 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 a it's a working trip it's a business deduction of course yeah yeah I know I need to set my next book in New Zealand or something. Right, right. <laughs> That's, right? That's, I used to be smarter about that stuff. Yeah. It's like, I will set this book in Paris and, and that will require me to go. Yeah. Well, we love having you in Milwaukee. Yes. And Boswell Great Books here. is like such an incredible treasure for our city. I'm so, I'm always so proud of Boswell. I love telling people about Boswell. Oh, yes. And make sure you buy lots of books from Boswell. We want to keep Daniel in business and happy. So. I've known Daniel for, how long has it been? Is it 20? 25, 25 years, something like that. Yeah, yeah. We go back. We go back the ways. So. That's great. Well, and thanks to all of you for coming out. It's such a treat to be in a live, at a live event. Right? Isn't this nice? One I miss. These, we miss this. I miss this desperately. My dream was to have my launch event at Boswell, and twice it's been thwarted. Uh, my book came out. Both my books came out during the pandemic, which is my claim to fame. So I could never have this. I'm so jealous. And one of these days, I'm just going to have to keep writing, or else I'll never be able to do this. So I hope <laughs> if I ever do write a third book, you guys will come. So, <laughs> so. we would have made. We would have made soldier, your soldier season paperback, but you're doing the event like a few days later yeah. for the poet's house. So we'll figure out something. Okay. Um, thank you both for a wonderful uh, evening. Um, thank you all for coming. Wouldn't have a bookstore without you. Thank you for the virtual folks. Um, anyone who registered will also get a copy of this recording, if all goes well, um, which we hope you will share and spread the word about how wonderful um, uh, Louis Byard's uh, Jackie and Me is. Uh, we have copies for sale at the front of the store, as well as a few backlist titles, as well as uh, uh, Christina Clancy's books, as well as one copy of the editor, because I thought, oh, why not? Yeah. So, um, Stephen. <laughs> and um, we will be signing at the front of the store as well. Um, thank you to Chris for doing our tech. And I know it. And I uh, hope to see you all again. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.